God give you salvation and glory. Yes, yes. You know, Revelation says that's what we're going to be singing for all eternity. Yes. So we might as well get used to it. Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your awesome power. Thank you, God, for being supreme in all creation. We thank you, God, for being our Lord. Now take charge of these vessels of ours and speak through this one that we might all hear, that we might all receive. I always follow. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We preach you in Jesus' joy once again. And invite your attention back to the sixth chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Today we're going to focus on verses four, on verses five, on verse five. Sorry. Today we're going to focus on verse five. Verse five says, "Woe to me!" I cried, "I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty." We are continuing uh, in a series called, Are You Available? Uh, and uh, today's installment will be called, Who Me? Whoa. Who Me? Whoa. Today, we want to continue and up to now, we've dealt with what availability means. It means present and ready for use at hand, accessible, definition one. Definition two says capable of being gotten, obtainable. Definition three means qualified and willing to serve. And it was emphasized that availability has to do with time, or making space in our schedules, priority or placing importance on an activity or behavior, preparedness or attitude, I'm sorry, and having the desire to fulfill what is being asked, and preparedness or being equipped or competent to do what has been asked. We also saw through the experience of Isaiah that in God's economy, Making ourselves available to God is not just an immediate decision that we make, but rather a process that we go through during the particular seasons of our lives. And that process involves refocus, revelation, realization, renewal, and response. In our installment on refocus, we learned that we must deal with our anxieties. Those things that distract us from giving God our undivided attention. And then last week we learned that revelation from God, or a revelation of God, will show us that God is higher than us, therefore gets to make decisions at, at a level above us. That God can arrest our attention when God's robe fills our temples. That God is holy and that there is no darkness in God. That God can shake from our foundations the hindrances that keep us from serving God completely. This week we've come to understand that once we've had a revelation of God, we can never be the same. Once I've had a realization of who God is, in our case a revelation of Christ, the next thing that we will grapple with is who I am. So today's message, who me? Oh. Isaiah had been a religious functionary. 
Nice guy serving in the temple, doing his job. But when Isaiah had a revelation of God, it changed his entire ministry. When he caught a glimpse of God's holiness, he came to understand that holiness is consuming. When, we, when he had really come into the presence of God, when God had grabbed his attention and he came to appreciate the awesomeness of who God really is, so awesome that in God's presence, flawless angels had to cover themselves in humiliation. Yeah. He could not be the same. Yeah. Holiness means completely separate from anything that's common. Completely distinct from anything earthly or ordinary. When he came into the presence of God's holiness, the word says he was undone. He not only got a glimpse of the majesty of God, but he got a real perspective on who he was in comparison. When a person sees perfection displayed, all of the imperfections of everything around it immediately become apparent. When purity is seen, the impurity of anything else becomes immediately evident. When you see pure white, everything else seems dingy. When you see pure black, everything else looks gray. He wasn't taking any bribes. He wasn't oppressing folk or outwardly trashing the temple. He may have even been paid his tithes and doing his church work, or I mean temple responsibilities. But when he was exposed to true holiness, all he could say was, whoa! Now, I'm English pronunciation of whoa can be spelled in two ways. The first way is W-H-O-A. This is an exclamation of awe and amazement. Whoa! Look at that! Whoa! Can you believe it? And even though this was not the version in the text, I can imagine that it was the first idea that crossed Isaiah's mind. Whoa! Look at the pure splendor of God. But after the amazement comes realization. Then the W-O-E comes out. That's an exclamation of dread. Woe is me. It comes because of what is implied by the first woe. Woe, he's holy. Woe is me. <laughs> woe is me, I'm not prepared to be there for the consequences of unholiness. He said woe because he saw nothing else can compare to the beauty and splendor of God. Yeah. He said woe because he finally understood what David had written years before, that there is no one who in and of themselves does good, the good that God requires. He said, woe, because he came to realize that his righteousness was like filthy rags in comparison to true righteousness. He said, woe, because he understood that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the penalty for sin is death. He said, woe, because he became painfully aware of the corrupted and corrupting society in which he was living. Isaiah saw a revelation of God and not only it not only mesmerized him, but it also humbled him. It not only filled him with awe, but it also filled him with awareness. Beloved, when a person has a true revelation of God, it brings that person to a realization of who we really are. Our revelation comes not from, but comes from, a, uh, 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 but comes by the Holy Spirit as the Spirit reveals who Jesus Christ is to us. And it is, it's when we see Jesus who, for who Jesus really is, when we appreciate Jesus, the righteousness of God in bodily form. 
we begin to appreciate just how far off from that righteousness we really are. And as Paul says, it only, it really eliminates all bragging rights, all cause for boasting. It eliminates all sources of arrogance or pride. Why? Because God says, be ye holy as I am holy. God's standard of holiness we are measured against is not some arbitrary measure or some passing grade measure on how well we do, com com do compare to a church list of do's and don'ts. God's standard of holiness that we are measured against is God's own holiness. And the consequence is eternal punishment if I don't make the grade. Let me use an example that I use in membership class that I hope will make this plain to you. Let's say that my righteousness could be measured on a linear scale. 41st Street runs south to north. So let's say my righteousness measures from Spring Garden Street to Haverford Avenue. And let's say someone else's measures from Spring Garden Street to Lancaster Avenue. Well, they might think they have cause to look down on me, to talk about me, to judge me. But God's righteousness is the scale that we're all measured against, measures from Spring Garden Street to the North Pole and back like a million times. That's what I'd have to measure up to in order to get a passing grade. And that's what I realize when I have a revelation of God and Christ in my life, just how awesome God is and how far I am from measuring up. Amen. When I consider this, it ought to affect not just how I look at myself, but how I look at you. Doesn't matter what you've done or not done in your life. We are both in the same position relative to God. Amen. So you might not be a drug dealer, but what about the lie that you told? I might not be a philanderer, but my arrogance can condemn me just as quickly. Maybe I didn't hurt anybody, but I lose a grade just as fast for not helping somebody. Amen. Amen. We tend to focus on certain sins, but easily and conveniently sweep other sins under the rug. But God is holy, and no sin or no sinner can stand in his presence. We are at the mercy of Jehovah Michaelis, the God who sanctifies us. But I didn't come to condemn anybody today. Because the truth is that Isaiah survived the encounter. How did he survive the encounter? God does not reveal himself to humankind with a desire to consume or condemn them, but rather to, re to, to transform them and recruit them. Yeah, yeah. God revealed himself to Abraham and repositioned him to make him the father of many nations. God revealed himself to Moses and turned him from a fear-filled fugitive farmer to an instrument of liberation. God revealed himself to Jacob in, to, in a wrestling match and, and transformed him from a trickster to a trusted patriarch. Hallelujah. God re revealed himself to Gideon, and, and, and he thought he was going to die, but God transformed him and used his minority army to bring his people from, to deliverance from oppression. Yeah. In each of these encounters, they thought they were going to die because of the holiness of God, but God reveals God's self, and the person was not sure, who was not sure they were going to survive the encounter because they saw how awesome God was. But I stopped by to let you know today that the very fact that you're here today, the very fact that you're realizing how far off we all are from God's standard of righteousness indicates that we are all works in process, that we're on our way somewhere, and that God has not given up on any of us. The lack of qualification does not disqualify you from God's purpose and God's plan that he had when he created you 
place. In fact, it's a prerequisite for the work that God has for you to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. The only way we qualify for availability for God's purposes is if we are broken before Him. That's what prayer and motion just showed us. That's what God wants. God is not calling you because of your resume. God is not revealing He's God's self to you because of what you bring to the table. What God wants is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. What God wants is a spirit that realizes that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? What God wants is an appreciation for the fact that it was only your grace and mercy that brought me through. That I'm living in this moment because of you. I want to thank you and praise you too. It's your grace and mercy that brought me through. Is there anybody here that knows that it's grace and mercy? It's because of his mercy that we're not consumed. That's because of his mercy that we all are here today. That it's because of his mercy. That God has chosen us uh, to do His work. Yes. 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 Is anybody here that understands that it should have been me yes. paying my own penalty yes. on a hill called Calvary? Yes. Should have been me with the nails in my hands. Yes. But God loved me enough to want to take my life. Hallelujah. Anybody here that knows you were once blind, but it was God that gave you sight. God will not despise a broken and contrite heart. God wants a spirit that's thankful enough to wash his feet with their tears. God wants a spirit that understands like the woman who was caught, busted in adultery, that the law says I should be condemned, but Jesus declared me not guilty. God wants a spirit that understands like the leper, we deserve to be outcast, but Jesus brought us back in. Ah, brokenness. Brokenness. That's what you want. Yes. God also needs us to realize who we are before we can be available because the only way we can have compassion for those who God has called us to reach is if we know where they are. Some folk minister as if they've never been caught up in anything. <laughs> to be here.
win the cave. Before they get saved, they get delivered, and somehow they forget they get amnesia. That it used to be me in that place that you just SMH. It used to be me in that place you just shake it on your But it used to be you in a place where somebody had to reach down and pick you. Yeah. 